celebrate called Ascension Day. The day which commemorates on this day when Jesus ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, as our apostolic credo puts it. Forty days after Easter, this day is recorded, as Scripture says, and described specifically in today's text from Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascended. We actually literally would have celebrated it last Thursday, the 25th, exactly 40 days after Easter. Then, 10 days later, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, we celebrate Pentecost, Penta, five or 50. Five, 50 days after Easter, Pentecost will be celebrated. Next Sunday is our Pentecost celebration, when we rejoice in the Holy Spirit being poured out upon the people of God and the church being born, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. All of these celebrations are, if you will, symbolic. Just as I shared with our children, they symbolize for us a powerful purpose as Christ followers, that Jesus promised to give that gift that was promised by God, the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out upon us to enliven us as the church and to guide our way in that purpose. But it's interesting if you look at the text. In the story of this preparation for Pentecost, the disciples ask Jesus, Is this the time? Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? It's interesting that this is how the disciples posture the question to Jesus. Will you restore this kingdom? See, they're still thinking in those temporal terms, in those terms of the kingdom that they hoped for and celebrated the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey back on what we call Palm Sunday when they laid their branches down in their coats and cloaks and they cried out, Hosanna in the highest! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! This king, this king that will establish and reestablish the kingdom of Israel and be our political and military leader that will overthrow the Roman occupiers. And then Jesus went through the suffering death, burial in the tomb and resurrection, and even after all of that, 40 days later, as Jesus gathers with his disciples, they ask him the question again. Now, is this the time, Jesus, when you will restore the kingdom? When you will be our king? When we will be the people of Israel that will overcome and rule? i got to imagine in my own mind that Jesus, in his response, as he said to them, it is not for you to know the time or period that the Father has set for by his own authority, that even though those are his words on the outside, the internal dialogue in Jesus' mind was probably something more like this. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> right after all of this, they still don't quite get it. It's not your will and way. This kingdom that I speak of, this kingdom that is established on earth, it's not a kingdom like you think. It's not me sitting on the throne and ruling over you as, as the armies that defeat all of your enemies and set it up here on earth. No. This is a kingdom, as Jesus said, not of this world. But it is a kingdom of my heavenly Father and it is a kingdom that you could never imagine. I suspect the disciples, though, still were not understanding and, and even as we see it in scriptures didn't understand it until later when that gift is given to them and Jesus said when that gift come, comes you will receive power by the Holy Spirit that comes upon you and you will then be those who witness in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth you will share the gospel in mighty and powerful ways but they have to wait they have to wait for it. In the text, it says a little bit later in chapter 1 still, but at verse 14. And they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. Another contrast that you see in this story about how the disciples were thinking about it and what God's plan was is this. That after Jesus has ascended into heaven... And they're watching, waiting, wondering when he's going to come back again. The angels appear to him and say, why? Why are you gawking up in heaven? 
Jesus will return the same way. But instead, be ready. Go and prepare yourself. And so they go and they lock themselves away, if you will. And it says in that text that they devoted themselves to prayer for those 10 days until the Holy Spirit comes. But here's the other thing that they did. If you also read in, later in that text, you'll see that they decided they would also choose a replacement for Judas. They had chosen two who were very faithful and followed them for a long time. These two were Joseph, called Barzabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias, or Matthias. And it says that they prayed to the Lord, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these two should be chosen. And so they basically cast lots. They roll some dice to see which one is selected. And what I love about that story, if you know the story, they choose Matthias, or Ma Matthias, Matthias. And they choose Ma Matthias, and that's the last time you ever hear of him. He's not recorded a, a, of again or reported on in the rest of the scriptures. What happened to him? Here's my suspicion. That this was not what God had willed and planned for them. This was not God's desire. God didn't tell them to do it. It's something they were sitting around twiddling their thumbs, waiting for this Holy Spirit to come. They thought, what are we going to do? I know. Let's choose somebody to replace Judas. I suspect that was probably Simon Peter's doing. I mean, he was the one, right, who was always a little impetuous. Hey, let's get out of the boat and walk on the water. Hey, let's go ahead. Let's jump in and swim to the shore because it's Jesus. And he would think after he already acted. And if he had thought about this, I suspect he would have realized, maybe we shouldn't do this. But you see, their will and way, their desire, their thinking, their hope and God's, we've got those. But they did pray. They were faithful in their praying, and that's a good word. Prayer is powerful. There's a man named Doug Coe. And Doug Coe, who died earlier this year in February, on February the 21st, Doug was a spiritual leader and a mentor, if you will, for many in Washington, D.C. He was one who was very uh, involved in planning the annual National Days of Prayer. And before Doug's passing, he had opportunities over many decades through many administrations and lots of politicians who came and went in Washington, D.C. to influence them and to guide them and to pray for them. And he tells a story by, that was record, recorded and recounted then by a man named Pastor John Ortberg. John Ortberg is a Presbyterian minister and author of many books, including one of my favorite books, If You Want to Walk on Water, you got to Get Out of the Boat. You, you ever read the book? It's a great book if you haven't picked it up. If you want to walk on water, you've got to get out of the boat. It's one of my favorites because in the story, he has a chapter about Sabbath, about renewal. And he also says that one of the holiest or most sacred things that you can ever do is to take a nap. And i got to love a guy who encourages you to take a nap. And in the book, he recounts the story from Doug Coe about a man named Bob that he had a chance to mentor. And let me share with you the story. I've got some notes here because I want to get it right. So one day, Bob comes in, and he's all excited, right, with Doug. And he says, i got to tell you about this scripture that I read. It says, it, it's really, really true. A ask whatever you will in my name, and you shall receive it. And he can't hardly believe that. He says, is it really true, Doug? And Doug gives him that good, qualified, pastoral response. And he says, well, Christ does answer prayers. Great, says Bob. Then i got to start praying for something. I, I'll pray for and Doug wonders if he'll pray, you know, to win the lottery or to get the Humvee like I sometimes like to pray. But no, instead, Bob wants to pray for Africa. He says, oh, I'm going to pray for Africa. So Doug thought, well, that's a pretty broad prayer. How about, why don't we narrow that down a little bit, Bob? Why don't you choose something specific about Africa to pray for? So Bob decides that he's going to pray for Kenya. And he says, I'm going to pray for Kenya for six months. That's excellent, Doug says. That's an extraordinary prayer. Why don't you do that? Let me challenge you, Bob, Doug says. I challenge you that if you can pray for six months for Kenya, and if nothing extraordinary happens from your prayers, then I will pay you $500. But if something extraordinary does happen in a remarkable way, and you pray for those whole six months, then Bob you'll pay me the $500. And if Bob doesn't pray every day, then he pays it as well. Now, that's pretty big. But Bob says, okay, I'll take that wager. And he does. And he goes home and he starts praying. 
And he prays and he prays and he prays, but nothing seems to be happening. And then one night he records that he's at a dinner in Washington, and he meets a woman that he happens to run into, and they get to talking, and she says that she runs an orphanage in Africa. And she runs this orphanage, guess where? In Kenya. And it is a Kenyan orphanage. Bob's excited about this, and he's just all energetic. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. You know, he knows about his prayer. She doesn't, and she's like, what's going on here? And he's really excited. So she says, well, you need to come. If you're this excited, come to Africa and visit. So Bob goes to Kenya, and he's appalled at the poverty and the lack of basic health care that he sees. And so when he goes back home, he decides to continue to pray for them. And he prays and he prays and he prays. And he goes to the large pharmaceutical companies that he has some influence with. And he says, please take your sur surplus drugs and send those to Kenya. And so they do. And they send him over to Kenya to this, uh, this orphanage. And Bob gets his phone call from this woman. And she says, what did you do? And he says, why? What's the matter? He says, nothing. You can't believe it. I'm so excited. We have so many medications that have been sent to us. We can't use them all. And we're distributing them all throughout Kenya. And he's so excited about this that the president of, the, of Kenya calls and tells him to come to Africa and to come back to Kenya and to go to that orphanage. And so Bob flies back to Kenya and he goes to the orphanage and they have this huge party and they welcome him and they celebrate him and the president is rejoicing because these medications are not just for the orphanage but all over Kenya. And he takes him back to Nairobi, Kenya. And in Nairobi, he gives him a tour of the capital city and then takes him back to the presidential palace and is celebrating with him. And as they're journeying back, they go into his presidential office, and the, the president of Kenya says, is there anything you'd like to say, Bob? And Bob, after touring, remembers that he'd seen some prisons that he'd toured. And there were prisoners that he'd asked about, and he said, who are those prisoners? And the president told him that they're political prisoners who've been in jail for many years. And Bob feels this calling by the Spirit, this urging, he says, to talk openly and honestly with the president, the president of Kenya. And he's not sure about it, but he goes ahead and he says, those political prisoners, yes, says the president, that's a bad idea to have them imprisoned. You should set them free. You should let them go. And then he gets on a plane and gets out of there. <laughs> After he gets back to the United States, the story is told by Doug, that Bob said he got a phone call from the U.S. State Department after coming home. And the State Department, he thinks, is probably going to really uh, get on his case about saying these kinds of things to the president of Kenya. He's probably created some sort of a political crisis. But instead, the State Department head wants to speak to Bob, and they ask Bob, what did you do? He says, I, I just told them what I thought. He says, we've been working for years to get these political prisoners released to no avail. But now the prisoners have been released and they've been told that it's largely because of you, Bob, and your intervention. The government was calling to say thanks to Bob. And Bob's wondering, what is going on? And then he gets a call from the president of Kenya. If all of that wasn't enough, he gets a call from the president to come back to Kenya. So Bob goes back to Kenya as told by Doug, as recounted in the book by Ortberg. And when he goes back to Kenya, it's because the president is getting ready to rearrange his whole government. He's going to put brand new members of the cabinet on for him. And before he does, he asks Bob to come to the palace and to go to his office and to spend three days praying with and praying for the president before he chooses the new leaders. <laughs> Can you imagine? And all of this because for six months, this man committed to prayer. And these three things, the medications being sent and the president inviting him and releasing those prisoners and then calling him back to pray for him as he chooses the new members of his cabinet, all happened in a short time frame of how many months? Six months. The power of prayer. The power of prayer is unbelievable. Next Sunday, we will celebrate the most important day of the church on our calendar and that is the day of Pentecost, in my estimation, because it is the day when the gift of the Holy Spirit fell upon us. It is at least the symbolic reminder that we are empowered with that gift of the Holy Spirit, that we have that power within us. Pentecost occurs 40 or 50 days after Easter, but more important than that, it took place 10 days 
before Pentecost, Ascension Sunday, when they were called the disciples to pray. And so they did. They prayed. For 10 days they prayed and waited and prayed and waited and the gift of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now what I wonder, I have a question about is this. If after Jesus ascended into heaven and waited that 10 days, what would have happened if the disciples had not prayed? We don't know. But here's what I suspect. That if those disciples that Jesus had called and commissioned and set up and invited to wait, if they had not spent that 10 days praying, I wonder if God would have chosen them to be the ones on which the gift of the Holy Spirit would be given. Or would have he simply looked at it and said, you've got to be kidding. You see, I have my thoughts and ideas. God... I sometimes pray, God, do this, go this way, make this happen. It's a laundry list that I come to the Lord with sometimes. And I find that a lot of times those prayers, those things that I ask God to do, that's not what God does. You know what God often does? Just the opposite. Goes this way when I want to sometimes go that way. And that's what we need to remember, just like the disciples. We've got to stop being those who think we know what to do and decide what we want to do and instead stop and wait and pray and be those who put it to prayer. And we're going to be in that place in just a couple of weeks, two weeks from today, on June the 11th, as I shared with you at the beginning of the service. We have the opportunity to discern the will and the way that God has for us. And I invite you with me to pray. I'll close with this. One other little story. It's about a, name man, uh, a man named Mike Slaughter, Reverend Mike Slaughter. What an interesting pastoral name. Hi, I'm so-and-so. Who are you? Hi, I'm Reverend Slaughter. <laughs> Sorry, Mike, if you're watching the video. Mike Slaughter is the pastor of Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in Tip City, Ohio. Several years ago, when I was still serving in Kankakee, I had the chance to go to... Um, a conference that Mike was leading at his church and we went there and heard him talk about his story and I remember this and I've held on to it all these years 15 plus and Mike said that when he went to Ginghamsburg Church back in the early 70s 1971 that it was a little bitty church a little small white country church set out surrounded by fields outside of the city he felt like he'd probably been sent by the district superintendent to go and to uh, close the church but he didn't believe that that's what God had called them to. Not death, but life. Not decline, but growth. And so he prayed. And he says that not only did he just simply pray about it after he'd been there and gotten to know the people, but he went out behind that church and he sat out in the field, which was now harvested. I don't know if it was beans or corn. And he sat in that harvested field and he said, Okay, God, as he looked at the church in the distance, he said, I want you to tell me what you want with this church. They say that they're going to die I say that that's maybe not what God wants and so he prayed and he stayed right there and he prayed and he waited and that church went from 19 early 1970s of, to eight, of 89 attendees 100 members to in 2014 the last statistics that I've seen of worshiping 2400 on a Sunday who come and are shaped as disciples with a budget that was $27,000 when he went there and is now several million dollars annually and several of that million goes to missions all around the world. Prayer. It begins with prayer. So I want to invite you as members of O'Fallon First United Methodist Church and this part, uh, part of this community to covenant with me to be in prayer. To commit from this day forward for the next two weeks, for 14 days, to pray daily for this church. And that God's will and way be discovered for us. Not what I want or what we want individually, but what God wants for us together as a community. That we might discern that. We mark this day today on Memorial Day weekend, a day that was once known as Decoration Day, a day when we outward and symbolic ways mark something that is inward, an inward call to devotion and commitment, to pursuit of those same freedoms and liberties, hopes and dreams that our nation has 
just as those who gave their life in service and sacrifice for those ideals. And likewise, we gather today as the church called to remember the sacrifice that Christ made upon the cross for the forgiveness of sins, that those, as he said, who sit in darkness might see a great light, that those who are bound by the shackles of slavery to sin and death might know that they've been set free, and that we might be those who share that with all the world, that we might be the light on that hill, that we might be the hope and the reconciliation in Christ. And I hope that today we'll go from this place and remember that as we serve. Let us pray.